what is really Masjid Al-Aqsa to the Muslims? What does it really mean to us? And what kind of spiritual connection are we supposed to have to Masjid Al-Aqsa and the blessed land around it? My brothers in Islam, before I begin answering these questions, I wanted to be clear about one thing. And that is, and be clear with me on this point, that a masjid is never holier and more sacred than a human life. And so it's wrong to say that our only concern for Palestine is because of Masjid Al-Aqsa. As a matter of fact, one Palestinian life, one Syrian life, one Burmese life, one Muslim life is far more precious and more sacred and more honor, more honorable in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than any masjid on earth, including Masjid Al-Aqsa. As a matter of fact, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, إِنَّ الْمُؤْمِنَ أَعْظَمُ حُرْمَةً مِنَ الْكَعْبَةً That the believer is more honorable. His blood is more sacred in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the Kaaba itself. And what is the honor that Allah Azza wa Jal gave the Kaaba so that you can understand what honor Allah made for the believer? Allah Azza wa Jal, He says regarding Al Masjid Al Haram Al Kaaba, He said, "Wamin yurid fihi bi ilhadin bi zulm nuziqu min azabin alim." Allah Azza wa Jal said concerning Al Masjid Al Haram that anyone who intends evil or harm in that place. Allah Azza wa Jal would inflict upon him and he warns him of a severe, intense, continuous punishment. And that is just for the one who intends evil in Al Masjid Al Haram. And just like that, the one who intends to harm the believer, Allah Azza wa Jal has promised him an intense punishment. So imagine the punishment of the one who not only intended and planned attacks against the believers and the Muslims, but rather he carried out his evil and he carried out his harm against the believers by slaughtering them, massacring them, bombing them and their masajid, driving them out of their lands, stealing their land and stealing their masajid. No doubt, no doubt their punishment is severe and intense. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroy the oppressors and their followers and their allies. My brothers in Islam, let's now reconnect with Masjid Al-Aqsa. Let's reconnect with Baytul Maqdis, Jerusalem, and let's speak about its importance and what is the road back to it in order to restore and to, yani, to restore this land back to the Muslims. Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu, a companion of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he asked him, Ayyu masjidin wudha fil ardi awwala? What was the first masjid that was constructed on earth? For Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he responds and he says, Al masjid al haram. Al-Masjid al-Haram in Mecca was the first to be constructed. Then I asked him, which after that? He said, Al-Masjid al-Aqsa, the furthest masjid. It was called that because it is far away from Mecca, for it was called the furthest masjid, Masjid al-Aqsa. Then Abu Dhar said to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Kam kana baynahuma? How many years were between their construction? When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Arba'oon sana, 40 years. And what we learn from this, my brothers in Islam, is that Masjid Al-Aqsa is the second masjid on earth. So it is a very early masjid and our history with it is a very long history. And it was constructed by Adam alayhi salam, who also constructed the Kaaba 40 years before it. Adam alayhi salam was the first one to construct the Kaaba. And 40 years after, he constructed Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. And in some narrations, it was his son Sheath who constructed Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Ibrahim alayhi salam came later on and he rebuilt the Kaaba. So Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَإِذْ يَرْفَعُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ الْقَوَاعِدِ It was already built. He just came and rebuilt it and reconstructed it. And Ibrahim alayhi salam, he builds the Kaaba alongside with his son. And years later when he travels to Jerusalem, subhanallah, he rebuilds Jerusalem and he rebuilds Masjid Al-Aqsa alongside his, uh, his other son, Ishaq alayhi salam. فَيَعْنِ الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ وَالْمَسْجِدِ الْأَقْصَى They make two-thirds of the holiest masajid in the world. Subhanallah, each time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to Bayt al-Maqdis, to the land of Jerusalem, He refers to it as a blessed land. الَّتِي بَارَكْنَا فِيهَا And not only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed the land of Jerusalem, but He also blessed what's around it because of it. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, سُبْحَانَ الَّذِي أَسْرَى بِعَبْدِهِ لَيْلًا مِنَ الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ إِلَى الْمَسْجِدِ الْأَقْصَى الَّذِي بَارَكْنَا حَوْلَهُ Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, the land that we also blessed, whatever is around it. Ibn Al-Jawzi, rahimahullah, he has a very, very beautiful reflection with this. He says that 
Ibrahim alayhi salam, he sanctified Mecca. Yani he declared Mecca as being a holy land. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sanctified al Medina, and then he said, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took it upon himself to sanctify Baytul Maqdis, to sanctify Jerusalem, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always ascribes and attributes the barakah, the blessing of that land to himself, as he says, Allati barakna. We blessed, and in so many parts of the Quran, he mentions this. It is Allah Azza wa Jal who blessed Al Masjid or Al Baytul Maqdis. In the time of Musa, السلام, this is going further now in the history, with the time of Musa السلام, and Bani Israel, when Musa السلام, and Bani Israel were rescued from Fir'aun and they headed towards Jerusalem, Musa السلام, he commanded Bani Israel, 600,000 of them with him, to enter Jerusalem. Enter it, and there's no fee, and that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commandment for you. But they were scared. And that they, they, they did not enter because of al qawm al jabbarin There was a tough nation inside. They got scared. They said, Ya Musa, we're not going to enter because of what's inside. Subhanallah, Allah Azza wa Jal, as a result, because they disobeyed Allah, Allah forbid upon them al bayt al maqdis for 40 years. Um, and then in these 40 years, they were made to be lost in the desert. They were wandering in the desert, had no idea where they're going. Why? Because they disobeyed the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, Musa alayhi salam also suffered because of their disobedience. And he too was forbidden from Baytul Maqdis. And this is the very same situation of our situation. Let's see what Musa alayhi salam did and imitate the same thing he did. Musa alayhi salam was forbidden from Baytul Maqdis 40 years and during those 40 years he died. What did he do during these 40 years? That is the same thing we're supposed to do and imitate. It is narrated in Sahih al-Bukhari or Sahih Muslim that Musa alayhi salam, he approached death during those 40 years that he was in the desert. And Sa'al Allah, he made a dua. Sa'al Allah an yudniyahu min al-ard al-muqaddasa ramyatan bihajar. He asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, since I can't get into Jerusalem, oh Allah, bring me close to it. Let me be just a stone throw away from it. Let me just be able to see it before I die. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says that if I was there right now, I could show you his grave. He's buried beneath a road under the red dome just outside of Jerusalem. Oh, subhanallah, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says to us that Musa alayhi salam did hajj. Yani he went to Mecca and he saw the Kaaba. But even then, look where his heart is. It is longing for Jerusalem. This is the connection that we're supposed to have with Baytul Maqdis. And how many times have you and I made dua for Allah to bring us close to Baytul Maqdis? Made dua for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring us a stone throw away from Baytul Maqdis, let alone asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for us to pray inside. For after Musa alayhi salam's time, and under the leadership of Yusha ibn Nun, which is, was the servant boy of Musa alayhi salam, they managed to conquer and restore Baytul Maqdis, and they entered. And obviously, يعني, once again, when the people lost their deen, and when they lost their laws, and they did not apply and abide by the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah took this land back away from them, and that was by the entrance of Jalut and his army. And so they took it from the believers, and years later, the believers under the leadership of Talut were able to reclaim Bayt al-Maqdis once again. And Talut was, and Jalut was killed by Dawood alayhi salam, and of course, they claim the holy lands after this. Years go by, the son of Dawood, which is Sulaiman alayhi salam, he inherits leadership and prophethood from his father, and he rebuilds Masjid al-Aqsa. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says in the authentic hadith, when Sulaiman alayhi salam finished the building and the construction of Masjid al-Aqsa, he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for three things. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him two of these things, and we hope that Allah Azza wa Jal has also granted him the third, as the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ameen to the third one. And what was the thing that he asked for? He asked Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala firstly, to give him sound wisdom and judgment that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is pleased with. And he was given that. The second, he asked Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for a unique and special kingdom that is not befitting for anyone that comes after him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him this. And what was his third request and dua? He asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and listen to the virtue of Masjid al-Aqsa. He asked Allah 
that if any person was to leave his house with the intention of praying at Masjid Al-Aqsa and no other intention, just to go and pray there, that they would leave from their salat purified from all their sins the day their mother gave birth to them. This is the reward of Hajj. This is the reward of Hajj. In other words, he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that any prayer in Masjid al-Aqsa be given the same reward as al-Hajj. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, and we ask Allah that he has been given this dua. In other words, in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Ameen to this dua. And this is why Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, he used to go all the way from Medina, can imagine all the way from Medina, all the way to Jerusalem, just to pray two rak'at in Masjid Al-Aqsa. And he wouldn't even drink a cup of water in Jerusalem, just so that he doesn't break that intention, that I'm only going there for salat to earn that reward. For this is what Sulaiman alayhi salam asked for. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us with a salat at Masjid Al-Aqsa. And during the lifetime of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he made Al-Aqsa, he made Al-Aqsa his qibla for the night prayers and his worship. That was the qibla of the Muslims at the beginning. And one night, as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sleeping next to the Kaaba, Jibreel alayhi salam comes to him and he opens his chest and he takes out his heart and he pours inside of it al-iman wal-hikmah, faith and wisdom, to reassure the heart of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he's about to take him on an incredible physical journey that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Subhan al-lazhi asra bi'abdihi laylan min al-masjid al-haram ila al-masjid al-aqsa al-lazhi barakna hawla linuriyahu min ayatina. He's about to go on an incredible journey, both physically with his body and his soul. Because Allah azza wa jalla says, bi'abdihi, his entire slave. ف... And Allah Azza wa Jal is going to show him from his miraculous signs. And Allah Azza wa Jal speaks about Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and he says, Al-Ladhi barakna hawlahu, the one that we blessed around. Uh, Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhu, he says, you know why Allah blessed that land? He said, you know why? This is the reason. He says, because there is not a single inch, there is not a single inch in Jerusalem, except that an angel stood there in worship. Or there was a prophet that worshipped Allah in that area, or there is a prophet that is buried in that area. This is why it became blessed. Fa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to take the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's going to take him to that same place that is blessed. And Jibreel alayhi salam, he comes down and he brings with him an animal called al buraq And this animal is so fast that with every step it reaches the end of your eyesight. Fal Buraq got anxious, he got worried, he got nervous, the Buraq, the animal. Jibreel alayhi salam, he said to it, relax, calm down. There has never been a more honorable man that has ridden on top of you. And it calmed down and it relaxed. Well, you subhanallah, you have to realize my brothers, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he could have taken a Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam straight to the heavens. That could have happened, but he didn't. He took him to Jerusalem, he took him to Masjid al-Aqsa. He went there because there's something special about it. There's something important about it. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, continuing that narration, he says, when we arrived to Jerusalem, Jibreel alayhi salam, obviously was with him. Jibreel pointed to the wall and the wall split in half. And he tied the buraq in the middle of that wall. Subhanallah, when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is witnessing all this. Then the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, I entered the masjid al-Aqsa. And I prayed two rak'at. And when I finished from the two rak'at, I raised my head and I saw all the prophets there in front of me. Imagine Ibrahim alayhi salam, or Sulaiman alayhi salam, the one who built the Masjid al-Aqsa, or Adam alayhi salam, or Ayyub alayhi salam, or Musa alayhi salam, the one who wished to come near al-Masjid al-Aqsa, he sees them there. And they were waiting for me. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, they were waiting for me to take my position and to lead them in salah. And I was shy. So Jibreel alayhi salam came and he took by my hand and he took me all the way until he put me in front of them until I led them in salah. And this is the only time all the prophets gathered in such a manner. And he led them in salah. 
and this is what made the ummah of rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam khayra ummatin ukhrijat lidnas the greatest of nations that was ever that ever came about because we led the prophets in salat and then the Prophet وسلم, from there went up to the heavens, got the commandment of a salat. He came down and he went to his people uh, in Mecca and he began to explain to them what had happened and they did not believe him. So they began to ask him questions about Jerusalem. And he couldn't remember, obviously, so many things were happening with him until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought in front of him the image of Jerusalem, Wal Masjid al Aqsa, and every single minor detail they asked him about, he was able to answer. Subhanallah. After that, Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu, in a hadith, he says that one time we were sitting around the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we asked him, Ya Rasulullah, which is better? Baytul Maqdis, or the house, or the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which one is better? For Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Salatun fi masjidi afdalu min arba'i salawatin fihi wa la ni'ma al-musalla huwa. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, one salat in my masjid, one salat in Masjid al-Nabawi is better than four prayers in Masjid al-Aqsa. Yani the reward of praying in Masjid al-Aqsa is 250 and that is the authentic narration. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said concerning Masjid al-Aqsa, وَلَا نِعْمَ الْمُصَلَّهُ And what a beautiful place it is to pray. And he said, and listen to this hadith, how powerful it is. He said, and there will come a time it's as though Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he knows that a time will come in which the believers will be deprived from Masjid al-Aqsa for a very long time, just like today. He said a time will come that it will be more beloved for a person to just have a small piece of land, the size of a rope that is used to tie a horse, to have a small piece of land where he can look at Masjid al-Aqsa, where he's able to look at Masjid al-Aqsa, and that would be better for him than the entire world and that which is in it. Just a small piece of land, not where you can pray in Masjid al-Aqsa, rather where you can see al-Masjid al-Aqsa. That would be more beloved to him than having the entire world and everything that is inside of this world. In other words, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is validating our emotions that the believers will be barred from this place. However, they would love it so much that this would be their dream. They will live wherever they are, in their palaces, in their houses, wherever they are on earth. But they are crying at night because they want to be able to see Masjid Al-Aqsa. This is the love that we're supposed to have for Masjid Al-Aqsa. And this is the same love that the companions radiallahu anhum had for Masjid Al-Aqsa. And uh, يعني, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the day of Fatah Makkah, on the day of the conquest of Makkah, when they were traveling from Medina to Makkah, and he had the companions with him, and they were heading towards Mecca, a man said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Ya Rasulullah, inni nadartu lillahi, in fatah Allahu alayka Mecca, an usalliya fi bayt al-maqdisi raqatayn. He said, O Prophet of Allah, I have made an oath to Allah, that if he opens Mecca for us, I'm going to go pray two rak'at at Masjid al-Aqsa. Well, he's going to Mecca, which its virtue is better than Masjid al-Aqsa. But listen, look to what he's saying. For Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said to him, Salliha huna, pray here, pray in Mecca if we open it. Why are you going there? For he said, Ya Rasulullah, I said, I want to pray there. For Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say to him, pray here. For he said, Ya Rasulullah, I want to pray there. For Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Sha'nuka idhan, do what you want. This is a burden you've placed on yourself. But this was their love for Masjid al-Aqsa that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught them. فَيَعْنِي سُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ وَالنَّبِي صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ During his life, what was his effort in reclaiming Masjid Al-Aqsa? He prepared the army of Usama ibn Zayd رضي الله عنه. He prepared that army and he sent it towards that area so that he can conquer Masjid Al-Aqsa and bring it back in the hands of the Muslims. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam died and he did not see that being achieved, then Abu Bakr رضي الله عنه's time came. And what did he do? What kind of efforts did he put to replace and restore Masjid Al-Aqsa? He sent as well the army of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the army of Usama ibn Zayd, he sent it again. And it wasn't conquered at his time. It was only conquered after this at Umar radiallahu anhu's time. In where, يعني, after it was conquered and the keys were about to be given, well, Abu Ubaid ibn al-Jarrah was there, well, Amr ibn al-As were there. And uh, يعني, the armies were outside the doors and the gates of Jerusalem. 
and the, uh, the Romans and the empire of the Romans and so on, they did not want to give the keys of the gates of Jerusalem except to Umar ibn al-Khattab because of what they heard of him. He said, we don't give the keys except to your leader. Bring him, we'll surrender and we'll give him the keys. For they said to Umar radiallahu anhu who was at Medina, they said, come and take the keys from the Romans. They're about to give us the keys so we can enter Baytul Maqdis. For Umar radiallahu anhu, he came. He came and his clothes that he was wearing had about 17 to 20 patches in it. And he was on a camel and he took one servant boy with him. And as they were traveling, the Romans, they wanted to honor Umar radiallahu anhu. So they rolled out a very long red carpet for him. And they prepared a, a huge reception and a ceremony for him. This is not an easy event. We're going to about to hand over the keys of Jerusalem. Umar radiallahu anhu, as he approaches Jerusalem, he gets there and he has his boy who he had agreed with him that I will travel half the way on the horse, on the camel, and you travel the other half on the camel and I will pull it. And as they get close to Jerusalem, it happened to be that Umar radiallahu anhu is the one walking and his boy is on the camel. And as they get close, there is, it's, يعني, as يعني, Ibn al-Jawzi rahimahullah, he mentions it was muddy. And so his, his clothes became mud. And they got there, they got close. And Abu Ubaidah, he sees him in this style. He's coming with a camel. He's got holes in his clothes. It's all dirty and it's all muddy. He's walking and he's not riding. Abu Ubaidah said to him, you've embarrassed us. You've humiliated us. Take my ride. It's better than your ride. Go on top of it and take these clothes and wear them. It's better than your clothes. For he said to him, and these are the famous words, and these are words, Wallahi, if we understood, we'd know what the way back to Baytul Maqdis is. He said to him, Ya Aba Ubaidah, he said, Inna Allah a'azzana bil Islam, faman ibtagha izzatan ghayra al Islam adallahu Allah. He said, O oh Abu Ubaidah, Allah has honored us with Islam. And if we were to seek honor other than Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would humiliate us. And so Umar radiallahu anhu explains the way back to Baytul Maqdis. It is with your Islam. That is how you enter back Baytul Maqdis. You enter it with Islam, not with the dunya that the people possess. And this is the same idea for my brothers and uh, my brothers in Islam. Establish your salawat. Hold on to your deen. Abide by the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Get closer in your relationship with Allah. And this is the only way that Bayt al-Maqdis will be restored. And back in the hands of the believers, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to free Bayt al-Maqdis from the Zionist Jews. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring back Bayt al-Maqdis with honor to the believers. And we ask him subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us people of the Quran, people of the Sunnah. محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعون أجمعين أقول قول هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم